Good morning, Henry Street. We want to welcome each of you to the Sunday morning worship service here at Henry Street. And uh, certainly it is our pleasure to, to have you with us. We're glad to see all of you. And if you're watching uh, on Facebook, we're certainly glad that you tune in and ask that you continue to do so. We just uh, appreciate you coming out to be with us this morning. And uh, we want to... Uh, continue to encourage each person to continue to press on and not become discouraged during this pandemic. And, and hopefully before too long, we'll, we'll be back meeting in the, in the sanctuary. Yes. But until then, <laughs> let's encourage one another and just keep pressing on. Remember those who are sick and continue, those who, continue to pray for those who are in need of prayer, those who are sick, those who are bereaved. And at this time, we're going to begin by getting a song leader up. page 539 victory in Jesus yes, page 539 victory in Jesus everybody have it listen I heard an old story how Savior came from glory and how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me and I heard about it Groaning of his flesh and blood atoning. And then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And he saw me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loves me and I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. And I heard about his healing of his sins and fire revealing and how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus and come and hear my broken spirit i then obey his blessed command and gain the victory oh victory Oh, my Savior forever. He saw me and he brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me into victory beneath the cleansing flood and I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the songs of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, oh, my Savior forever. He saw me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him. And all 
all my love is to him. And he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. <clears throat> Also, let's notice page 76, Heavenly Sunlight. Page 76, Heavenly Sunlight. <coughs> Everybody have it? Let's sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey. Over the mountain, or through the deep veil, Jesus has set out. I never forsake thee. I promise divine that never can fail. And heavenly sunlight. A heavenly sunlight, I'm flooding my soul with a glory divine and hallelujah. I am rejoicing, I'm singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, the shadows above me, they never conceal my a savior and God. He is the light, in him is no darkness. Close to his side in heavenly sunlight, a heavenly sunlight, and flooding my soul with a glory divine and hallelujah. I am rejoicing. I'm singing his praises. Jesus, Jesus is mine. I am the bright sunlight. I ever rejoicing. I'm pressing my way to a mansion's above. I'm singing his praises. How gladly I'm walking. I'm walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, and heavenly sunlight, a heavenly sunlight. I'm flooding my soul with a glory divine and hallelujah. I am rejoicing. I'm singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Let the church say amen. amen. Those of you who love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, say amen again. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That's the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 
and 2. And we'll be reading from the King James Version. And it reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And may God add a blessing to all of your, uh, each and every one who hear and obey his word until the end. Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal and great God of heaven, we bow this morning just acknowledging your greatness, knowing that you're God and besides you there is no God. We come this morning just thanking you for the many blessings that you showered upon us. We thank you for health and strength, the ability to get up and come together this morning to share in another worship service. We just ask your blessing upon all of those who are gathered here, all of those who are listening on Facebook and and we just pray that you continue continue to bless us all. And we uh, ask your blessing upon the churches of Christ everywhere who are gathering today to uh, praise you and do the things that you have commanded us to do. We ask that you would help us all to continue to grow, help us to uh, be able to share with those in darkness the things that is necessary for each person to do in order that they might have eternal life. And we just come this morning asking a blessing upon the sick everywhere in the hospital, those who are at home, and we especially, we especially pray for our Henry Street family. who We've had a number of uh, members who've been out uh, sick for quite some time or ill from time to time, and we just ask that you would bless them all. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are perhaps uh, out, of, out of work, uh, to no fault of their own, and we pray that you would help them to find employment and, just pray that things will be well with all of us. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to help someone else as we have opportunity to do so. Yes. And we just pray for those who are in darkness. And we just pray that you will help us to be prepared to share with those who are in darkness the things that uh, they need to know. And we pray for those who are turned aside and, and use the pandemic as an excuse and not be involved in any kind of way. Uh, to not do the things that they're supposed to do. And we just pray that you will help them to have a change of heart and we'll, uh, we'll repent before it's eternally too late. We come asking a blessing upon those who are in uh, government positions, whether, whether it's at the federal, state, or local level, and help them to make good decisions. We pray that you will help us to be a better people, uh, help us to have a greater love one toward another, have every person's best interest at heart. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to be good examples in our community. Help us be careful what we do and help us to always be good examples. For we uh, have no intention of bringing uh, shame to the church. And just help us to be aware of that at all times. And we just pray this morning, Heavenly Father, for those who are going about teaching your word, especially those in foreign land, those abroad, we just pray that you bless all of them and, and help them to continue to be successful in carrying the word and we pray for those who are being oppressed by those who do not believe what the church believes. And we just pray that you uh, help things to be better with all of them and give them relief from the adversaries. We just thank you Heavenly Father again for this opportunity to uh, forgive us of our sins and to pray that this age that a home in heaven will await us. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blood, page 8. And the last song before we get into the sermon, 
is uh, page 63. Restore my soul. Restore my soul. Everybody have it? Let's see. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, and please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul, renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored, my cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord, replace all doubts and fears with faith so bold, renew my love, Rebuild my faith, oh, restore my Let the church say amen. amen. As always, we're excited to be in the house of Almighty God. I was thinking as worship started and, and perhaps during worship how it's a wonderful thing to be among my brothers and sisters in Christ on this grand occasion here today. A lot of people didn't wake up this morning, folks, and were not able to share in another worship service. So it's a wonderful thing that we'll be able to reunite one more time to unify in worship of our Lord and our Savior. So as always, take that moment and reflect upon your own life of what God brought you from, what he brought you to, and where he's going to bring you to in the future. We still serve the one that's going to give us eternal life. When all is said and done, we'll be able to lay down all of our burdens uh, at the feet of Jesus Christ on that great judgment day to come and hear those sweet words well done thou good and faithful servant so we ought to be excited we ought to be happy we ought to be joyful that we have this opportunity to give back to God the worship and praise he so rightly deserves I don't know where your mind is right now but I do ask you to go ahead and clear your mind this morning what I mean by that, you know that you're John 4, 24 Christians, right? That God is a spirit. And they that worship him must do what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember, God says worship in the spirit, meaning from your inside. So he says worship starts with you. And so we're going to take care of that right now. Don't worry about what your job is going to do tomorrow. Don't worry about what you got to do later on today. Don't worry about your cares and your troubles. Throw them down right now. And make God the center of the universe in your heart that he gets 150% of you uh, right now. But I'm also grateful for our two elders that have done a wonderful job over these years in their leadership of the entire flock. Meaning myself, I appreciate the wisdom, the sacrifice that they both make. And also all of my brothers here that are participating in this worship service that in you in the parking lot that also do what you do behind the scenes to glorify God in your life personally and in public as well thank you as well as our sisters who do a wonderful job of being lights for jesus in this community as well we're grateful for all that you do but i do as always want to echo the sentiments of our elders and also and want to invite you out again if you're a first time visitor here at the henry street church of christ know that you're our honored guest and as always like we like to say the red carpet of welcome is always extended unto you 
to come back and worship with us once again. And again, before getting into the Word of God, I want to thank my wife for continued love and support and make you all, make you all understand. And I'm not ashamed and I'm not too much to say I love every last one of you here. And we'll take that beyond the grave and down the streets of gold forevermore, loving each other and, of course, praising God around the throne forevermore when that great day comes for all of us. But I want to take us back to Romans 12, verse number 1 and verse number 2, which was eloquently read in our hearing. And I want to use it in a way that we're probably not used to. In other words, it tells us to be different than the world. Now, I'm not talking about the world that don't know Christ. I'm talking also about the world that is of denominationalism. We need to be different than everybody else in the world because if I can be totally honest, and it's a sad statement, but those that claim the name of Christ have departed from him a long time ago. And I'm going to show you why that this has happened. But by the grace of God, as one of our heroes has said, repentance brings us right back to God. So that means that today we're going to be like some of the old school preachers. You probably thought about when you think about some of the pioneer preachers that came through Alabama, Tennessee, and the rest of the South being someone like Marshall Keeble. Or in my case, uh, in my family four generations ago, we had a preacher named Paul English that came to Lamar County, West Alabama, the city of Vernon, Alabama, and did a tent meeting. And my family at that time was a part of the CME Church. Y'all know where I'm going with that. It wasn't called Christian Methodist Episcopal back then. It was called Colored Methodist Episcopal back then because of discrimination in the Methodist Church. They broke off and formed their own, but unfortunately they didn't form the right church. Amen, somebody. Amen. Because we know that Jesus said, I'm going to go over that a little bit later on. He said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not, prepare for, uh, shall not prevail Against it. In other words, Jesus only came to bring one church into existence, not the 20 or thousand or so denominations in the world that you see here today. So it's going to be our mission here today in order to show you truth from error and so that you can take just two things in order to identify the church of the Bible as opposed to the church of man. Oh, amen, somebody. Because there's a lot of man made churches out there that can't save nobody. I'm just being honest with you. But they still claim to be sent by God. I'm going to show you. If you don't follow certain biblical pa uh, patterns, according to the scriptural commandments and examples, then you're not the ch Lord's church. Oh, I hope y'all can receive this here today. I know it's tough, but the truth, it may hurt, but at the same time, what the, church, uh, the, the truth does, it hurts, but it patches you right back up shortly thereafter. So I want to tell you again, my family came out because, Mar uh, not Marshall Keeble, but uh, Paul English came in a tent meeting four generations ago and preached to my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents. And the Bible, and, and, and they, the family history tells us that the, in that tent meeting, 70 people obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're also thankful to Paul English, the word of God that came through him, not for, only for the spiritual blessings, but he also made us move all the way to Detroit. Or oh, that had to be a powerful preacher, you know, Amen. to take you not only from the darkness of sin, but to take you to a whole other land 14 hours away. So we're appreciative of what Paul English has done. So what we're going to do today is going to be representative of those pioneer preachers that reveal the truth to us. Now, we've got to call some names and, and get in some uncomfortable positions, but the truth should not make enemies as long as your heart is able to accept the truth. Let's go to Romans 12, verse 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed. Now, this is what I want you to pay attention to. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, that's the rereading of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse number 2. And the subject on our heart today is simply, majority think is not always a good thing. Majority think is not always a good thing. Let me take you in a history lesson really quickly, and we're going to come right back to the Word of God, as this is going to talk in symbolism as well. You see, being a citizen of the United States, it submerges us into the American culture, its ways and its manners of living. This means that we are American 
in all that we do. You see, our culture plays a big part in the way that we think, even when it comes to Christianity. In other words, we learn Christianity through the lenses of American culture. Sometimes that's good, but sometimes that's bad at the same time. See, think about it this way. Our culture plays a big part in how we actually think. And it makes us make mistakes in the scriptures too. You see, think about it as American. We think of freedom where the government should not have much interference in our lives. That's a foundational thing of American citizenship. We think of freedom in terms of having different job opportunities where you have a chance, as we like to say, to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps instead of being dictated to as to what profession and life and economic class you're going to be in like communist, res uh, communist regimes do in other countries historically. We think of freedom in terms of free enterprise as much as possible. In other words, businesses are owned by private citizens and not governments. And we think of freedom in terms of having a voice in everything that we do. Of course, we have a better term for that. We call that having a vote. And generally speaking, we as Americans believe that uh, our government should be by the people due to the majority of the voting public determining the direction of the country politically. But because of our original history as a British colony, we shy away from and even detest monarchies. That is, kings and queens calling the shots without people having any input into their lives. This mentality filters down even to the decisions that we make informally. I'll give you an example. As a former company that we used, I used to work with, instead of just a manager or upper level management just handing down the policies and procedures, this is what you're going to do, this is how you're going to conduct yourself as far as you being an employee of this firm, we actually voted as a department on different things and that would be become the decision that would be made for that department. So we even use democracy in my old job in order to, 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 to guide the direction of a department as well as the overall outlook and strategy of the company. So again, ingrained in our minds culturally, our thoughts of freedom, democracy, the principle that the majority should rule, and the majority decisions are always right. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with a democratic process. I'm not preaching against that when it comes to politics. And of course, I never would argue against that. However, there are cases where we must understand that majority think can also be a bad thing. And we must deviate from the majority at times in order to be pleasing to God. For example, let me give you some examples so you know where I'm coming from with this. There are situations within Christianity where democracy does not apply. Oh, let me pause there for a minute so you know where I'm going with this. In other words, there are just some times in the church and some things in the church we cannot vote on things because biblically speaking, when it comes to something written in God's word, our vote does not count. Oh, I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Let me show you some things in the world where people have put politics over the Bible and it has caused for that church to become heretics. In other words, for example, Pope Francis is the head of the Catholic Church as of March 13, 2013. Bishop Charles E. Drake, Charles E. Blake Sr is the head of the Church of God in Christ, which is a Pentecostal fellowship. And at last note, Pastor J.D. Greer was elected as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And of course, more and more heads of churches, I'm just giving you examples, could be presented as these are things that are done in denominations, thousands of denominations across the world. But let me tell you something right now. These things should not be enough now these should be, that is, enough to expose practices that should not exist in the church. Of course, I'm not personally attacking these men, nor looking down with the idea of supremacy over anybody else. But I want to ask you this morning, what's wrong with this picture I just painted with you? Where you have men that are heads of churches. Well, let me let you think about that for a moment. See, to think about it this way. Instead of the Bible, democracy was used to elect these men and put them in place. Instead of the scriptures, the votes of people put them in charge of these churches instead of God putting them in charge himself. Oh, I know people don't want to hear that. 
You see, the people's opinions and want for a leadership are just like the children of Israel. If y'all remember, before the book of Judges, the people had no king. Oh, amen, somebody. But the people got beside themselves, and they wanted to be just like the world. And so they ended up basically giving their vote through their opinion. And God said, okay, well, since you're rejecting me, I'm going to give you exactly what you want. And that could have been the worst. I, should I shouldn't say could have been. It was the worst thing that ever happened to them. Because the Bible says that the first king that became the king of the children of Israel was Saul. And he probably was one of the most disobedient and evil kings that they saw. You see, when you think about it this way, when you want man to lead you, you're going to get man's sins leading you too. Amen. Oh, amen, somebody. That's right, when you want man to lead you, he's going to bring his imperfections to the table. And when you want man to lead you, he's going to eventually let you down. Because he does not have the perfection to be the head of the church. Oh, amen, somebody. I don't know anybody else's name. In Hebrews 4, 14 to verse number 16, but Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says he was tempted like all of us, yet without sin. So that means we can duplicate every thought, deed, word, and action Jesus does and still be pleasing to God at the same time. We can't say that about any man. That has become the head of any church. You see, it's so easy in America. Remember, church is just like free enterprise. Oh, amen, somebody. That is, in America, all you got to do is rent out a storefront, put your name on it, and you got a church. Amen, amen somebody. Right. But unfortunately, that don't mean that God acknowledges it. Huh? That does not mean that God is pleased with it. And it does not mean that God wants you to do that in the first place. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. You have to understand why people do this. What well, the Bible tells you, there's three types of temptations Satan puts you through. The Bible tells us that Satan always tempts us with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. So when you have that lust of the eyes, that means money, money, money. Or like the old Jays used to say, don't act like y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. When I say the old Jays, amen, somebody. Y'all listen to R&B like everybody else have done. They want to rise up. And basically make a business and put it behind the name of Christ when Christ didn't send them in the first place. Amen. Huh? When they want to be many kings in their own community. Or they want to feel like they're somebody else. They'll put on like, oh, y'all know what's going with this. The old preachers, if you've been around long enough, they'll put on that backwards collar. Y'all remember what old preachers used to say, right? They put it on that backwards collar, call themselves reverend, apostle, pastor, or minister. And then they fool a flock and fleece them out of their money. Amen, oh, amen, somebody. I'm just telling you the truth here today. So, folks, you have to understand that just because democracy was used to elect these men and put them in place does not mean that God is proud of that and God is pleased with that. So, again, being elected doesn't mean that you are a leader from God. Amen, somebody, if I can tell you the truth here today. You see, when it comes to the Lord's church, no man can be elected as the head of the church. Huh? No man has the right to be called the president or the CEO or the head bishop and all that kind of stuff. I challenge you, just like he used to say Marshall Keeble used to do back in the day. One of the stories I heard about Marshall Keeble, he would go into uh, denominational churches. He would sit there and he would challenge the preacher there in front of everybody. And he would say, if you can show me the name of your church in the Bible, I leave. And guess what? None of them were able to do so. You know why? Because they didn't say what was in Romans 16, verse number 16. The Romans 16, verse number 16, what did it say, church? Salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Oh, amen, my friends. I'm not knocking you. But in that scripture, do you see Methodists? Amen. No. Do you see Baptists? Huh? Do you see Pentecostal? Huh? Do you see Apostolic? Right, then man. why do you call yourself these things when they're not biblical to stand, start with? Oh, amen, somebody. I know I'm making enemies here today, but hopefully I'm making at least one friend, somebody receiving this here this morning. So again, the head of the church has already been selected thousands of years ago by God himself. His name is none other than Jesus Christ, and the church belongs to him and him only. Amen. The church belongs to him and him exclusively, and we cannot vote him in, 
And we sure enough can't vote him out. Amen, Amen. somebody. Amen. Because Jesus said, in Matthew 16, verse number 18, he says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock are you talking about, church? Faith in him as the Son of God. He says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not what? Prevail against it. The Apostle Paul makes it even more clear that Jesus is the head of the church with his timeless words from God that say in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Amen. Even more ownership of the church belongs to Jesus because it was purchased with his own blood according to the teaching of the word of God in Acts chapter 20 verse 28 which reads, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Oh, amen, somebody. I don't know about you and I hope you don't take this offensively, but if I am to get killed and my blood is spilled, it's not going to save nobody. Oh, amen, amen, somebody. I don't care who's calls himself apostle, preacher, or reverend here today. If he shed his blood, every ounce of it, it won't result in any salvation for anybody else. So if he cannot shed his blood, if he cannot go back to Calvary, if he cannot be nailed to the cross, then he sure can't be my leader. Amen. Oh, amen, somebody. He cannot be the head of the church because he does not qualify. Just like I or any man ever will qualify for that post. So just because many people which is the majority in many cases have democratically elected men to the highest power in their churches. I didn't say Christ church. I said in their church does not mean you have to follow them. This is where democracy fails. Jesus can never be removed from his throne and replaced with anybody else. Don't you dare follow any imposters. Follow the real thing because Jesus is Lord and Christ and not any other man that's ever lived or will live on earth. Amen. Lastly, one last common practice of churches today that is anti-Bible is the voting in and out of church of those who either want to be a member or who is or the church is trying to expel from their fellowship. Maybe you didn't catch that because that was a long sentence. But you know in some places, in order to become a member of that church, that church got to vote you in. Right. Oh, amen, somebody. Now that's just plain evil. Are you telling me that the church is set up like a social club? That as long as you accept it by the people, you accept it by God? Amen. Huh? Are you trying to tell me that the church is like a fraternity? As long as the people accept you, then you a Christian? Huh? Now what sense does that make? Tell me, like Marshall Keeble uh, used to say, show me where in the Bible you get that. Huh? My good friend Charles Jones down in Tallahassee, or, uh, down Tallahassee, Florida, he used to say all the time, now that's a homemade scripture. In other words, that ain't in the Bible. You're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible itself. You see, folks, no disrespect intended. But if, if people were not so naive because they did not study the Bible for themselves, no one would get away with this godless practice of trying to vote people into the church. Remember, the church belongs to Jesus as his head and its savior. So no group of people, no matter how numerous they may be, no matter how much money they have in their pocket, no matter how much influence they may have, they cannot admit anybody into the church and they sure can't kick nobody out of the church. Remember, admittance, meaning to become a member of the church and being expelled, which is called disfellowship, must be done by what the Bible says and not the opinion of people in the church. For example, Here's what the Bible says about being admitted into the church. When you look at that first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 41, after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit through the apostle Peter was showing how the doors of the church were open unto mankind. Let me let you in before I read any more of this. I've gone to many different places and, 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 and been in different denominations. And at the end of the preacher's sermon, they say that the doors of the church are open. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. If you've been in the Baptist church, you know what I'm talking about. If you've been in the Pentecostal church, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The preacher get done preaching, he'll say the doors of the church are now open. Well, wait a minute. Who closed them in the first place? Amen. Oh, amen, somebody. The church uh, doors were open 2,000 years ago. And God never closed. 
the doors of anybody else. Oh, amen, somebody. You know, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't tell this joke. But y'all remember back in the Old Testament when men tried to carry the Ark of the Covenant? When they touched it and they shouldn't have touched it, what happened to them guys? They died. <laughs> they died on the spot. So maybe some of these preachers of God done the same thing, talking about the church doors is open. When they touch the handle of the church, maybe they should. Oh, let me leave that alone. Maybe y'all didn't catch where I'm going from, going, going to from here. But let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to verse number 30, 41. And it talks about how the church doors were opened on that day and how they stayed open. And they're open to now until Jesus comes back. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 41, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Wait a minute, let's stop right there. Can I stop there for a minute? When they asked, What shall we do? In other words, they were saying, What are we going to do in order to be saved? They didn't say, Church, we have some candidates. I'm going to walk up to the altar. Y'all know where I'm going with this, huh? They didn't say, church, we want y'all to vote next week. Your vote going to come back and we're going to see whether or not this person can be confirmed as being a part of my church. Huh? That's what they do. That's what they do. But Peter didn't say, okay, well, we got a candidate now. Now you church vote on them and see whether or not they're a Christian. No, what did Peter say? Let's go back to that in verse 38. The Bible says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, which means the forgiveness of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as our Lord shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, get out of this crooked world and come to Christ. So that you can be saved. Amen, somebody. Same thing when you're part of these denominational churches that God never built in the first place. Peter was saying the same thing to you. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You see, when you start off with a foundation with a house that's no good, eventually the foundation is going to cause that house to fall. Amen, somebody. So if a church is not founded on Jesus, Jesus alone and his word alone, then it don't have a foundation. And eventually it's going to come crashing down Amen. on the judgment day to come. You see, in verse 41, he ends off saying this. He says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were what? Added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they say they were voted in and added to the 3,000 souls. What did they say? They were added. And who did the adding? God himself. Amen, somebody. Amen. Not no jack led preacher was adding them or no congregation that don't know the word of God. Instead, it was God that added them unto the church. And notice, they didn't have to wait a week in order to be a part of the church. Amen, somebody. That day they believed. That day they heard the, Bi the Bible. That day they repented. That day they were baptized. That day they were forgiven. That day they were saved. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen, but This is the word and the word of God only. Let me say it one more time. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So as you can see, Acts chapter 2 is a great gospel sermon delivered by Peter that opened up the doors of the church to mankind so they could be saved. After he taught that massive cry on Pentecost Day that Jesus is Lord and Christ, who died and rose again as evidence of him being a savior. The Bible says that the people were convicted in their hearts of their sins, took it upon themselves to believe in Jesus as the son of God and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. This led to the groundbreaking and truth revealing words of Acts 2 verse 41 again that says, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now this shows us that God immediately added them to the book of life which contain, which contains the name of the saved in Revelation 20 verse 11 to 15. This shows that God immediately placed his name Christian upon them according to the name of the children of God in Acts 11 verse 26 that says and when he had found him he brought him unto Antioch and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Now did, you, did Brother Bonds did they say that they assembled with the churches? No. It said what? It assembled themselves with what? 
the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians, what, first in Antioch. Oh, amen, somebody. What did the Bible call them? He called them Christians, right? He didn't call them no Baptists. Amen, somebody. He didn't call them Pentecostal. He didn't call them apostolic. He didn't call them nothing but what? Christians. Amen. First in Antioch. So why do you want to be called somebody else's name? Amen, somebody. You see, when I married my wife, she took on the last name Norwood. She better not go by Smith. Amen, somebody. Because if you go by Smith, that means she don't belong to me. No more. Amen, somebody. Amen. So could people say that all the time. Well, what's in a name? A name is everything. Amen, somebody. Since my wife has a name, Norwood, that means if I die, she get the house, she get the bank account, she get everything that I have. Amen, somebody. Amen. That means she got an inheritance coming if I die before she do, right? So the same thing happens when you wear the name of Christ. When you wear the name of Christ and Christ alone, you're part of his family. Amen, somebody. Yeah. When you're a part of Christ's family, you wear his name alone. That means you got eternal life that's waiting for you. When you wear Christ's name by itself, that means heaven is waiting for you. When you wear Christ's name by itself, that means the pearly gates are going to swing open on that judgment day. That's and when you wear people. the name Jesus himself, and only Jesus' uh, name, which is Christian, meaning the follower of Christ, that means you're going to walk down the, the, uh, the, the, the streets of gold and heaven's going to be your, be your home. So why do you call yourself other than what you're supposed to call yourself? Amen, somebody. See, you're dividing yourself away. You're pulling yourself away when you call yourself anything but what the Bible has called you, which is a Christian. So again, this shows us that God immediately get, made them his children according to the Bible example of Jesus own actions toward them that says the following in John chapter 1 verse 12 but as many as received them, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name and of course it's not this does, this does not show anyone voting the 3,000 believers on Pentecost day in Acts chapter 2 into the church because democracy has nothing to do with it man has no say in the salvation of others, their admittance, their interest into the same body called the Church of Christ, or or them being added to the family of God, has nothing to do with other people. What other people think? You see, these are all works of God, no matter what the opinions of others may be. So, in conclusion, my loving warning to you is this: If you are in a church headed by a man such as a pope, a head bishop, a president, etc., come out of these godless organizations. Because it does not matter how holy they appear. If Christ is not the head, then it's not his church. And there is no salvation there. So my loving compliment to you today is to thank God you have the faith that Jesus is the Son of God, your Lord and Savior. I lift you up for that here today. Now you must do the, the things right in order to truly make him the head of your life, your Lord and Savior, to become a child of God and to be saved. So the question then becomes, after you heard the word of God here today, are you ready to come out of the errors of man and take on the righteousness of Christ today? If so, this is your opportunity now to do so. Be an individual. Didn't you hear the title this morning? It's not about doing what the majority do. Be an individual. Because at the end of the day, we all have to stand in front of God as individuals and answer for the deeds that we have done. Remember, majority think is not always a good thing. Just because many people believe in something does not make it right. Righteousness is only established according to what the Word of God literally says and not the consensus of, uh, of opinions of many people who have no vote when it comes to salvation. So I want to thank you here as we end the Word of God called majority think is not always a good thing. So I challenge you this morning. Be an individual. Be different. For some of you, that's going to be very hard this morning. I'm going to tell you why it's going to be very hard for you this morning. Because some of you will be breaking away from your family traditions. Hmm? Yes, it's the truth. Some of you are going to be getting in arguments with mother, with father, with brothers, with sisters, with good friends. People you have been around and worshipped with for 30 years. You're going to feel like you're a traitor to them. Don't worry about betraying them. Worry about betraying God. Because you've heard the truth. And the truth is what's going to set you free. Oh, I hope I'm talking to somebody here today. You know what you have to do? 
is that you have to come out of that situation and then try to pull the rest of them with you. Is that all right, y'all? But you have to understand something. When it comes to saving yourself, you have to understand something. It's just like being on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. There's lifeboats that are there. You can't save nobody if you don't save yourself first. Amen. What I mean by that, you got to get in a lifeboat. You got to start floating and don't go down with the majority that's still on the cruise ship. And then you got to extend your hand back to them and pull them down in a lifeboat with you. But you got to save yourself first. It's just like also when you're on airplanes and they do those demonstrations that if you run out of oxygen on the airplane, the mask is going to pull down the oxygen mask. They tell you first, get the mask on you first. And then you try to help somebody else. Because if you pass out, you and the other person are dead. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. So obviously then, you got to come out of your car here today. You got to come out of your seat. You got to break tradition. And you cannot be afraid of who it offends. Because it's worse to offend God anyway. You see, when you see, look at Matthew 10, verse number 28, the Bible says, Don't fear what man can do to you, but fear him that can kill both body and soul in hell. Come on, guys. Think about your eternity here today. This could be the very last day that you have a chance to be saved. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, folks. Think about just what happened last year. When you look at around February 2020, who would have known the COVID virus would show up? Who, who would have known, who would have saw it coming that we would have just in the United States alone, but something like, if, I, if my, my, my math is correct, from the last report, 560,000 people have died since that day. Nobody saw it coming. And you may not see what's coming for you here today. We don't know if tomorrow is going to come for any of us. We don't know if there's going to be another Sunday. We may not be here next Sunday. The Bible said our life is like a vapor. We have to say if the Lord wills, then we'll do. And we'll do that as, as James has told us in the book of James. So do today. Don't put things off because tomorrow may be too late for you here today. So you must ask yourself, what is the biblical precedent? What does the Bible teach itself? regarding what one must do to be saved. Well, it starts off in Romans 10, verse 17, where the Bible says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what, church? The Word of God. Again, you got to go back to the Word of God and the Word of God only to establish truth and to be saved. The Word of God says in John 3, verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? everlasting life you got to believe in the bible's testimony that's rich in all the way even in prophecy from genesis to revelation that jesus christ is the son of god the lord and savior of the entire world you got to understand about your position in life without him the bible says in romans 3 23 and romans 6 verse 23 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god the ways of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through Christ Jesus. In other words, we cannot be saved without him. you got to accept the fact that he is the Son of God, the Lord and Savior, in order to be saved. And after you do that, you're on a good foundation, but you got to continue to build upon it. What I mean by that is you have to put your faith in action in order to be saved. So the rest of the plan of salvation is all about action. What I mean by that is Luke 13, 3 and 5. Acts 2, 38 tells us we have to repent before God will forgive us of our sins. That means to take the, 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 the old life and leave it behind you. That is to live righteously instead of rebellion against God in sin. After you repent of your sins, you got to show that you're not ashamed of Christ. That is, you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, which means the Son of God. You see in Acts 8, 37, Romans 10, verse 9, and verse number 10, under commandment, and under commandment as well in Matthew 10, 32, and 33. That we must confess Jesus in this lifetime in order to be saved. And we must go down in the watery grave of baptism for I believe at least four different reasons. The Bible starts off in Acts 22 verse number 16. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. So baptism number one is where God washes away your sins. That's when forgiveness comes. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 21. Baptism does not save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 
So it gives you a good conscience as well. In other words, that's when you know that you're forgiven of your sins and God will not bring it up ever against you again. You also have to understand in Acts 2 verse 38, the Bible says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it is the third part. It results in the forgiveness of your sins. And the fourth part of baptism is that it also adds you to the church. You see that in Galatians 3 verse 27 where the Bible says those that have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. That means you become one with him. You become a part of the family of God. So the question then becomes, do you want to do the easy thing here today, which is to just confess your fault, confess, excuse me, confess that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for your sins? That's not something hard to do. What we'll do is that we'll bring our song leader right after I sit down here. We're going to sing a song of invitation. That's your invitation to come down here. Give your confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we'll baptize you in the building here. The water's already ready for you for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, and you can correctly and gladly call yourself a Christian because you have done it the Bible way. And last but not least, us as Christians, always remember Jesus' commandments to the church, all of us in Revelation 2, verse number 10, where he said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And if you have fallen short as a child of God, don't give up, don't give in, pick yourself up by repentance, confession, and prayer. And God will forgive you once again and walk with you in harmony and peace once again, according to Acts 8, 22 and 1 John 1, 7 and verse number 10. So as always, I want to thank you for listening to the word of Almighty God. But I plead with you this morning, if you have not truly made Jesus your Lord and Savior in truth, according to the Bible in the Bible way only, I encourage you to get it right with God right here, right now. He's calling out for you. Will you answer the call? Won't you come as together, all of us that can, stand and sing the Lord's invitation. Won't you come? Page 8, are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in Him? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? All your garments, spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Let the church say amen again. Amen. We want to thank Brother Noel Wood for a wonderful, wonderful sermon uh, that each of us uh, need to recognize. Uh, we want you to know that uh, we got the time and we got the space Amen. to baptize you this morning. Amen. At this moment, all you got to do is come forward. You've heard the word. And when you hear the word, you acknowledge God uh, as our Lord that's over all of us that the church belongs to. And that he died and suffered for us to live again uh, with the Lord at the end of time. So if you want to be a member of the Henry Street Church of Christ, let it be known by coming forward. Amen. Our sick list is uh, uh, lengthy this morning, but that's okay. Uh, we will pray for each and every one that have their name on the sick list. Let us all go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow our heads this morning, Lord, just thanking you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord, for without your goodness, your mercy, that shows the love 
that you have for us, Lord. We would never be able to live with you in the last day, Lord. But you gave an avenue for us to be with you in the last day, Lord. And that's through the death and burial and resurrection of your son, Jesus, who shed his blood for us on Calvary's cross, Lord. And he also gave us the church, Lord, that through the service of our life in the church, looking at him and each and everything we do, that we will be with him in the last day. Lord, we bow this morning for each and every one represented here this morning. Our preacher who relentlessly preached the word each and every Sunday. We bow for each and every one that's gathered here in the parking lot, Lord, that you would just be with us, Lord, as we go our through our daily lives, Lord, uh, recognizing the sinful world is around us, Lord, and that we need you and only you could bring us through the situations that we be pressed with uh, through the suffering, Lord, that's in this world. And we pray that you would just be with us, give us the strength, build us up, Lord, from the inside out, Lord, cleanse our heart and bring us to the tuitions, Lord, of the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ. I will uh, uh, list started. It may be a little repetitive of what was already said, but we still praying, and we need all prayer that we could get. We pray this morning on behalf of Sister Marie Terrell, Brother and Sister Walker, Sister Hooks, Sister Nancy Mitchell, Sister Trinity Mitchell, Sister Ann Townsend, Mr. Edwin Thomas, Vicki Thomas, Loretta Thomas, Mr. Lorenzo Thomas, Charles Young of Birmingham, Thomas Vincent of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, the Douglas Hunt family for bereavement, uh, that passed away last night. Takeda and Roderick Pearson. Deshaun Payne was hospital, hospital uh, and his own life support. Sister Ida Sawyer. Sister Willie Ruth Beeson. Tony Watts suffered a stroke. The family of Willie Ash, that's bereaved. Eloise Cotton, Cheryl Davis, and John Ferris are having surgery this week. Aaron Heath hospitalized, and Sister Veronica Heath. Lord, we bow just praying for uh, uh, all these souls, Lord. You know who they are, Lord. You know what they stand in need of, Lord. We ask that you will look upon them, Lord, and bless them. Bless them even though uh, uh, they are bereaved, Lord. You got comfort for them. We ask that you will bless those who are hospitalized. That's on life support, Lord. We know that you are able to heal their bodies, Lord. We know that you are able to do everything that seems impossible and we know that's impossible for us lord we got a savior that is able to cure all our ailments lord and we know that you are here lord we ask that you will just be with the ones that's hospitalized and on even on uh, uh support that you were on life support that you would be with them, Lord, and lift them from the bed of afflictions, Lord, and return them to their loved ones, Lord. And we know that you're willing. We know that you are able to do this, Lord, and we ask that you would just be with them. Lord, we ask that you would be with the COVID victims, Lord, that's a, a suffered suffer, a, a bereavement. We ask that you would bless the families, Lord, and realize uh, that Death happens every day. It happens. We got to be able to deal with it, Lord. But we know that you could comfort us, Lord. 
Lord, we ask uh, you would bless the listeners that are worldwide who's listening to the sermon today, Lord, and realize we must do something to save ourselves, Lord. We got to come to you, Lord, for it's everlasting too late, Lord. We ask that uh, you would just make us as humble as we need to be, Lord, to touch the hem of that garment, Lord, in order to be saved in the last day, Lord. We ask that you would just uh, let the ones that uh, haven't got a shot or, or haven't uh, got vaccinated to go and get their vaccinations, Lord, to be able to present themselves around others and uh, our family members, Lord, and uh, most of all, Lord, that we'll be back get to uh, get back to the church, Lord, the inside of the building, Lord, and the comfort of one another, Lord, helping one another and being around one another and to do that will as a group, Lord. Well, we know that you want us all together, Lord, and uh, let us be able to shorten that day that we'll be able to assemble once again, Lord. And we ask that, you, Lord, that you would just be with our president, Lord. We ask that you would give him the words that he stands in need of in his heart, Lord, that he will supply the needs of each and every one in this country, Lord. And we pray for Congress that they will work right alongside him, Lord, and they all come to the conclusions that we need each other. They need us like we need them, Lord. And just praying that they will look at each and every one of us as we are all one. We are all one blood in the Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would just uh, uh, let the visitors, uh, those of us uh, uh, that's visiting us today, we pray that they will come back, Lord. They've heard the truth. We pray that uh, we as members would bring uh, visitors, the loved ones, to church, Lord. For we know that we are doing the right thing, first of all, Lord, and that we need you, Lord. And we pray that we will all come together, Lord, and realize it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we all need, we all do recognize, and we all will be able to go out and teach one another, Lord, that will for his everlasting too late, Lord. And we pray that for the ones that stray by the wayside, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, give them the strength to recognize you and come back to the church for his everlasting too late. For salvation lies in the church of Christ and in the church of Christ only, Lord. We pray that they will come back and work out their salvation in fear and trembling for his everlasting too late. We pray that you forgive us of all of our sins, Lord, for we know that there are many. And we know we, you said in your word, Lord, that if we will repent, you will forgive us, Lord. And as we go through our daily life, we should be able to repent less, uh, uh, to sin less and less and less and less. Striving for perfections, Lord, that we will uh, uh, stand recognized by you Lord, as a Christian in the Church of Christ, Lord, and we also come praying, Lord, that when the last day comes, Lord, and you open the Lamb's Book of Life, we pray that you'll be able to look at each and every one of us and say, well done, thy good and faithful service. And this is our petition this morning, Lord, we pray that you will go with us, be with us, keep us all from hurt, harm, and danger. These blessings we ask in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We are thankful for the opportunity for us to be here on this Sunday morning, and we are it's pretty especially thankful to God for all that he has blessed us with. Um, when we think about the fact that the Lord has blessed us with our means of uh, employment and ways to gather money to support our families and to um, provide for our basic necessities, but also to, to enjoy a few luxuries that we do. 
Uh, we should be especially thankful for him for uh, all that he does for us, especially on the financial basis. Um, but in that, we get the opportunity to show our appreciation by giving back a little bit towards him through his church. Um, and we are commanded to do so, but we also need to just think of it as an opportunity for us to support the church. Uh, and we're given a scriptural reference of how to give in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul uh, wrote, not concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let everyone lay by him in store, as God has prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. And we also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, where we're to give, um, not grudgingly or necessity, but we are to give cheerfully um, and willfully. And so with that being the case, let us give. If you have not given, please raise your hand and one of the brothers will come to you and collect your offering. But also if you would like to give electronically, you may do so through the cash app and our cash app handle is the dollar sign followed by Henry Street Church of Christ. And that's, oh, excuse me, Henry Street C-O-C. And that's capital H-E-N-R-Y, capital S-T, capital C-O-C. Um, and once again, if you have a collection to give, please raise your hand and one of the brothers will assist you. But at this time, let us go to the Lord in prayer to thank him for the offering. Dear God, we come to you this morning thanking you so much for the financial blessings that you've given us, and we're thankful for the opportunity to be able to give back. And we pray that as we give on today that what we do will be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. But Lord, we pray that the offering will be used in the wisest manner possible for the uh, upbuilding of thy kingdom here in Henry Street, but also for the spreading of the gospel abroad through our supportive missionary work. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also upon the first day of the week, we are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper, which commemorates the death and the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross. And we're given the scriptural reference of how to do that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the 23rd verse, where it states, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time saying thank you once again for your darling son, Jesus, who died on Calvary's cross for our sins. And we realize that had Jesus not died, we'd be eternally lost. So, Lord, we're thankful for his body, which was battered and bruised on Calvary's cross. And we thank you for this bread, which represents his body. And we pray that as we partake of it, that we'll do so thinking about your son's great sacrifice for all of us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily he does and drink a donation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this caused men are weak and sickly among you, and men are sleep. Let us pray. The God will come to you once again to say thank you for your son Jesus and his death on the cross uh, for the remission of our sins. And we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, his soul redeeming blood, that we will do so with our hearts and our minds focused upon Calvary's cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now have our closing hymn and benediction.
Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house. Everything's all right. Oh, in my father's house. Where there's joy, joy, joy. I want to thank each of you for coming this morning. It's certainly been our pleasure to have you in the assembly this morning. And as always, we're just delighted to have visitors. And we certainly hope that your visit with us has been an enjoyable one. And ask that you come back and be with us again. I want to thank Brother Noah Wood for the very fine message this morning. I think the message was clear. Everybody could understand it. You know, if it's not according to the scripture, then we really just can't depend on it. You know, I know you heard the song, perhaps, uh, say, uh, let the church say amen. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a word from the Lord, then you got it. Amen. And God has spoken, so let the church say amen. amen. We just accept what the Bible teaches, you know, and that's just all it is to it. Uh, let us pray. Eternal God of Heavenly Father, we come again just asking you to... Uh, bless each of us that gathered here this morning. Help us to continue to press on and help us as we go uh, on our daily walk that to help one another as we have opportunity. Encourage one another along the way and we pray your blessing upon all of those who are sick and afflicted. We pray at this time for Kenneth Densmore who's not feeling well. We pray that you bless him. Help him to overcome the obstacles that he's facing at this time and pray that all will be well with him. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with us as we go our separate ways, uh, protect and guide us throughout this week. It is in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.